Welcome, Fly Tribe and the Solution Seekers, and welcome to the Painful Truth Podcast, where we dive deep into the depths of uncomfortable topics, from health and fitness all the way to the painstaking topic of politics. Are you ready to unite and find solutions together? Let's go. All right. So we're going to go ahead and dive deep into why working in progression is important. And this can be transitioned over to anything in life that has, that takes an order. So if, if you're, you know, working on any kind of fitness regimen, or if you have a project that you're working on that needs to go in order, you can use this right along with it. But would you rather struggle along the path or would you rather enjoy the journey? Because I know for me, for a long time, I must have liked the struggle. But now I, I really enjoy the journey. And it's, it's really like walking before crawling. And you wouldn't do that, would you? I know if you're like me, you sure tried, okay? So if we wouldn't walk before we crawl or swallow before we chew, why would we try and deadlift 100 pounds before we try to 50 pounds? Or why would we attempt a double footlock on the aerial silk before we trained the single footlock? It is so often why you see people struggle while learning new aerial tricks. It's why you may experience whiplash on the way down from that drop you probably shouldn't have done yet. It is often why I see a lack of foundation in the traveling aerial students that come and visit my studio. But nowadays, literally, you can turn on Instagram or even TikTok and see the massive lack and foundation aerialists are missing. It may not be completely apparent to you or, or to others, but it's truly um, those subtle technique skills that make all the difference to the eye. Okay, and um, it's, it's just like when you are painting a house. If you allow yourself to go fast when trimming the edges with paint and you paint outside the line and you never fix it, it may not seem like a big deal at the time or even later or whatever the case may be because you might see it and think, oh, it's just real small. No one will see it. But it's truly those small details that make all the difference. So why is this occurring in our industry? There are several reasons why it's occurring, and we're just gonna break down a few. So the industry is, is pretty new to mainstream, and when the mainstream people got a hold of this once super magical art form, the circus art, the respect of the art form dissipated. Mm -hmm. Some of you may be telling me right now, as I speak, that's not true. I have respect for it. What is she talking about? Well, what I am talking about is a multitude of problems in the industry today, okay? So one of those problems is rigging. It is how people rig on anything and everything that seems hangable, okay? And it's why so often you hear people or see people post on social media asking why their equipment failed on them or literally fell on them and they fell to the ground. Literally, guys, having respect for your own safety only makes you a responsible aerialist. And it's, it's literally what sets you from amateur to going pro, okay? Going pro doesn't mean that you have to go and work in a professional setting. Not necessarily. You can act professional without being a professional, right? And we're talking about your life here. So when I see ill practices of aerial art, it, it really, I, it just really questions. It makes me question people, people's uh, common sense more than anything. So and it's just why, you know, you, you want to you wanna practice responsible tactics. While touring with the circuses, I learned very quickly about speaking up about the rigging I was presented with. I was prepared to say, no, I can't perform on that if, if I needed to do that. 
It was very uncomfortable though, at first, knowing that I was gonna possibly have to have that conversation with my boss, who I thought would just get rid of me. <laughs> and I learned to check my gear regularly as well. And even if you have a rigger in charge of the show equipment, because most times when you're on a professional show, you're not using your own equipment, you're using the show equipment. I learned that I needed to check that equipment See, I had a really pretty crazy experience when I was working with Ringling Brothers. All the aerialists were on this two-point harness. We had a point on one side, and then it went up to one point on the rig. Um, and it was always about 50 feet in the sky, I would say, at least. We were probably at least 30. But, and we all had our separate lift. We, we had a, we were all on a me mechanical lift and we all had our own mechanical um, operator, our lift operator. And these points were held in by our costume. So our costume was over the harness. So yeah, so one night while about to go upside down it going into the act and everything, one of my wires snapped um, leaving me kind of hanging sideways slightly. Thankful um, of my other side harness point and my costume holding me up mostly, I, I signaled to my operator down below to lower me down mid-act and after that I, I just started checking all my equipment all the time uh, that I used. So yeah, that, that was a hard lesson to learn. Most buildings are and, and honestly, a lot of this, this information that I bring out to you guys is from front hand knowledge of learning it a hard way for myself. But most buildings are made of made for a snow load is what they are called. It's a, it's a horizontal load. Uh, and most buildings are, are built with what are called purlings. And these are something that you should never rig on. And, and sometimes I'll see people rigging on these. And also um, the crossbars um, that are usually like at gymnasiums, people rig on those as well and they should never be rigged on. I consider myself really lucky, honestly, and I realize that most people don't have this knowledge, but it's, it's, it's what's one of the problem in and what's lacking, I think, of aerial knowledge today in classes and just aerial education because I, I was fortunate to be raised with my father, who's a contractor. He owned his own contracting company, and I grew up helping him with different projects, making $5 an hour, which I thought was amazing when I was young. <laughs> but I would do crazy stuff like help him side houses and roof, roof, um, you know, roof, roofs, <laughs> and um, demo work, and you name it, I did it. Uh, and, and so I just loved helping my dad and his specialty was actually metal. He even built our two story house by himself when I was in high school, all out of metal and the neighborhood called it the bomb shelter. This was when I was like in eighth grade, ninth grade, but I have an affinity towards buildings and the materials used because I've been raised around it. And, and luckily I, I've had my father to teach me about different ceilings and what to look for and so forth. Not to mention, you know, the endless hours of rigging workshops and real life professional work with riggers on, on shows that I've been lucky to be part of while performing as a pro. But even my studio in Amarillo, Texas, the rigging grid is engineered by a structural, structural engineer and then, uh, and that's totally for safety and for liability reasons, right? And then constructed by my father, um, which again, I'm really lucky to have. If you are a studio owner or a student that has your own rigging set up, you should always go the extra mile and hire an engineer to design your ceiling grid or to even just make sure you know, your ceiling is safe and, and how to rig it properly. This ensures you did everything correctly and that you did everything you could to be safe. And this would eliminate so many questions on social media that I see. Is this safe to rig from? Guys, no one has the answer for that except for a structural engineer 
who is in person with you. Okay, so save yourself time. I'm telling you, save yourself time and just go straight to the source. So this brings me to my second point, and that's safety. So safety has literally been thrown out the door, okay? The bloopers page on Instagram and TikTok do a total disservice to our industry. You, some of you probably are shooting my eyes out right now, or my voice, I'm not sure. Now, if if they are bloopers that don't hinder safety, I'm totally cool with it, and I and I wanna see them, they're funny. Bloopers should be funny, not scary, not sad, not making you wonder if that person is still alive, okay? I'm a totally 90s kid. Like, I, I totally grew up in the 90s. We had um, what they called the funniest home videos. Do y'all remember that? With uh, Bob Saget. <laughs> um, of course, first we would watch, like, you know, Full House with Bob Saget, and then we would watch funniest home videos. But remember some of those videos that would have you laughing, but totally laughing in pain. And as a kid, you know, you would just laugh hysterically, like when the gymnast didn't flip all the way over and landed on their face <laughs> and people thought it was hysterical. <sighs> we should never normalize falling from the aerial silk or any kind of apparatus or, or anything like that whatever it is that you're using, okay? We should never normalize falling. But when you don't allow yourself to crawl before you walk or train that single foot lock before trying the double, you run extra risk for injuries, okay? I only speak from a lot of experience, like I said before. And gosh, I, I, I really wish we had, you know, podcasts like this when I was going through my main journey of Ariel because I would have learned a lot. I wouldn't have had to find it all out the hard way. But because working with my father and all my life and working working out avidly with my mother, I was super strong. And when you are young, you really do believe you're invisible. However, it's, it's not like that you're thinking about being invisible or that you're thinking that you're invisible. At the time, you don't think about it. You're just doing it and having fun. But I promise you, my friend, 20 years later, you will be wishing you did things a little differently. And it's, it's crazy to me that I can even say 20 years later because it's literally been that long for me. I'm 40 freaking years old now. What? <laughs> but you need to be okay with taking a step back. You need to be okay with asking for help, right? You need to be okay with taking the time to learn in progression. I wish I had learned all of these things way before now, okay? Because look, a lot of you guys that follow me know that I have to go to the chiropractor twice a week just to feel halfway good. And it's a lot of the reason why is because of the way I, I, was, I trained when I was younger and, and all the stuff that I used to do. Like when I worked as a sawyer and worked on um, fire conservation, we, would, we had to fell these big burned trees in the forest and we would have to lift them. However, we did have these tools, but sometimes we would just lift them, manhand them and never ask for help. And that's just because we were young and dumb. Um, looking back, I wish I had just asked for help and I wouldn't, you know, my back wouldn't be so broken now, but you need to be okay with taking a step back. Okay. And taking a step back means being okay with saying, I'm not ready for that yet. That's not working for me yet. That is hard. I, I, that is, I just can't get into that. So taking a step back and being like, what would... What, what would be the next progression into this? What could help me get into this? And going to that step and then working it through. And then again, like I said, asking for help, you know? Like I, I, I wish I had learned way before, you know, now or whatever to ask for help because um, it's okay. You know, when I was younger, I used to think that I was stupid for asking for help. But now... 
I realized that it's actually a very smart thing to ask for help when you need it. Be okay with taking the time to learn in progression. I, I would like to say that all we have is time, but I really don't feel that way. I feel like I never have enough time. But taking the time to learn it in progression is gonna, it's just gonna be your best friend. You know, if you're wanting to do this for longer than just, you know, in the moment or just a few years or a handful of years, then take the time, man. I mean, because look, you got time. Just enjoy it. Doing these three things that I just spoke about, taking a step back, asking for help, uh, you know, taking the time to learn in progression, it will only help you keep from getting injured. It will only help you with your aerial journey and help it last a lifetime and not just for like your 20s or 30s. Because look, I really wish that I had trained a little differently and would have asked for help a lot of those times when I needed a spotter or or just needed some help lifting something or whatever. The aerial is hard on my body now and it's because I didn't take the time in, in, the, in, in my past. I didn't take a step back. I didn't ask for help. I didn't learn in progression a lot of the time. We just did it. We were like total old school, you know? And I don't blame any of my instructors, any of my training coaches at the time. It was just how it was. Just kind of like back in the Arnold Schwarzenegger days, you know, the bodybuilding days. You know, things were just a lot more rough then. So it also will help you progress on your apparatus faster. Even when taking steps back, like I was saying, I promise, because what happens if you, you know, skip a step in your training and get injured? then you're benched and then you may have problems with that specific injured spot your whole life kind of like i do now but if you allow yourself to ease into skills and tricks and even take a step back when you need and need that extra training you will have a steady pace and you know what that means steady pace wins that race. So another reason there is a lack of foundation. Let me just put that back down. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, people are not allowing themselves to go through the necessary progressions. It takes in order for the process to be easy. Because literally like when I teach my students at the studio, they 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 rarely struggle with 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 uh skills and tricks and it's because i lead them into this progression and then when i have them actually do it boom they can do it and they understand what i'm asking them to do because we've practiced the pathway and we've developed the muscles the correct way to just bam do it and the mind you know so literally i i, I feel like i can teach anyone how to do aerial silk or any kind of aerial. I don't care if you're 300 pounds or if you're 70 years old. With the proper progression and time, you will achieve what you set out to do. I am a I am I'm really big with technique. It's it's not even funny. Bad technique is like fingernails scratching on the blackboard. And I have a knack for spotting students' weak spots and where to improve. Traveling aerialists will come through the studio and there is a night and a day difference between them and the students who go to flying fitness regularly. It's because my curriculum is highly based on progression. It's progressional based. I have students ask if they can learn this and that. And I reply, yes, you can learn that. Just not before you learn this, this, and that. Some get it and some don't. Some end up leaving because they don't get it and that's okay. But the ones that do get it, they go on to be awesome, confident aerialists. All right, Fly Tribe and Solution Seekers, 
Be aware when you are training this week, train for longevity and not the moment. We will see you next time. Thank you.